Good morning, everyone, and thanks for attending uh, my lecture. Uh, I apologize, I could not make it in person uh, due to the fact that I uh, uh, recently received uh, an important funding from the European Research Council, and, um, and therefore um, I was I'm quite busy setting up uh, things uh, to start the project. Uh, I'm greatly honored uh, to receive the Roynley Award, uh, and I am very grateful to the ACA for awarding me this distinction, um, even more so that I do not consider myself uh, a, to be a crystallographer, but rather a spectroscopist. So this is absolutely um, a great um, a great honor. Um, so uh, this is a campus of the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. Um, I'm actually retired, and this, the new funding I got uh, is... Uh, for a project that will be centered at uh, the synchrotron and free electron laser uh, Eletra in uh, Trieste, Italy. Uh, nevertheless, I, I still uh, have some activities at the EPFL. Uh, this is Lake Geneva, and this is this cheesy looking building. It's a central library, uh, which was built by a Japanese architect, and I think he got the equivalent of the Nobel Prize uh, for it. Let's go to the topic of my talk, which is about time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy and how we came to uh, do the developments with it now. Okay, I like to start these talks by this famous sentence uh, from Francis Crick. If you want to understand function, study structure. And there are many methods to study structure, of course, on top of all of these is X-ray crystallography. Um, however, when you think about uh, function, uh, you imagine things moving, and as usual, this thing doesn't work. It works one out of two times, uh, where in principle, you this simulation shows the transport of water through a membrane uh, channel, membrane channel. Um, uh, and anyway, the point is, function implies time-dependent structure. So if I dare. Uh, uh, I would replace a sentence by, if you want to understand function study, time-dependent structures. Now, this issue of uh, time-dependent structure is uh, an old problem in science. And back uh, at the end of the 19th century, um, uh, there was uh, um, uh, a French physiologist and anatomist, Etienne Jules Marais, who was interested in animal motion. So um, in order to describe and understand animal motion, he developed a device uh, uh, called the shutter camera. So he's really the inventor of the shutter camera, which at that time he called the, the photographic gun, the fusil photographique. Uh, I guess this is where the expression uh, to shoot a film comes from. And anyway, uh, and he did beautiful snapshots of, uh, of animals uh, in motion. Uh, in particular, the most famous one, that's not the original, eh, is uh, the case of the cat falling paws up and then landing on them. And you see the cat undergoing uh, isomerization, double isomerization, recovering the initial symmetry and then getting to the ground state. Uh, later in his life, Etienne Jules Marais got also interested in uh, fluid flow and turbulences in, in fluids. Uh, and he did also some very nice uh, films of uh, fluid flow. Anyway, let's come back to the cat. If you, if you take the side of the cat, uh, which is about 30 centimeters, and <clears throat> um, the, 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 you reduce it to the size of a chemical bond, typically three angstrom, well, the scaling factor between 30 and 3 angstrom would bring the millisecond shutter camera, uh, uh, opening time of the shutter camera uh, of one typically less than one millisecond, I think in this case, to sub picoseconds. So this is all what is about, you know, looking at time dependent structures and it all depends on the, on the object that you are uh, studying. And uh, typically here you have, uh, depending on the, on the type of problem you want to look at, uh, animal motion, again, as I said, milliseconds. Uh, for example, the case of uh, the transition from the relaxed to the tense state of hemoglobin in microseconds, uh, uh, electronic relaxation in uh, nanoseconds, uh, rotation of molecules, acoustic phonons, what have you, in picoseconds. And, it, and if you cross into the sub-picosecond regime, then you enter into the uh, time scale of uh, in 
interatomic uh, motion in atoms, molecules, uh, sorry, in molecules, uh, proteins, and crystals, uh, be it uh, torsional or elongation. So typically, if you have a photon that impinges in your eye, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, retinal chromophore, which absorbs light, will undergo isomerization in less than 200 femtoseconds. Uh, you can have uh, bond elongations, which are typically in the tens to hundreds of femtoseconds, and these depend on the weight of the atoms. If the atom is very light, then the, vibra the vibrational period is very short. This is a case for the OH bond in water. Uh, and if you have heavy atoms like, uh, you know, the iodine molecule, then it's 300 femtoseconds. Then you can go even below the femtosecond in the attosecond time delay. This is done nowadays. Uh, and that is a time scale of electron motion. So the quest for uh, time resolution was a constant effort since the end of the 19th century. And um, uh, and there were, uh, you know, the development of flow and stop flow methods in chemistry. But the, the some major developments took place after the Second World War with the uh, implementation of relaxation methods and flash photolysis, which led to the Nobel Prize to Manfred Eigen, Porter and Norrish in 1967 for time-resolved chemistry. Uh, early 1960s, the lasers uh, appeared, and they quickly reached uh, by mid-1970s uh, the femtosecond time domain. And um, for his use of femtosecond lasers and uh, his development of femtosecond spectroscopy for chemistry, uh, the whale was awarded. Uh, Ahmed the whale was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1999. Um, However, these all these efforts well well done using optical domain spectroscopy, IR visible ultraviolet, which in the hundred uh, which uh, which which operates in the hundreds of nanometer wavelengths, uh, and of course uh, with such wavelengths you cannot get structure. If one wants to observe in real time interatomic motion, then you have to bring uh, together the uh, femtosecond resolution of uh, of lasers with the uh, high special resolution of X-rays, uh, typically 0.1 to 1 nanometer. So when we uh, started working on uh, time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy, uh, the only sources of tunable pulsed uh, X-rays were synchrotrons, uh, but they give only 50 to 100 picosecond pulse durations. Uh, and then later on came the laser slicing, which had a, an ephemeris uh, life of about five years at most, uh, prior to the advent around 2010 of the X-ray free electron lasers. There were also, um, and X-ray free electron lasers can go into the attosecond domain. Uh, there were also laser uh, plasma sources. These are uh, line uh, uh, sources. Uh, they are basically like an X-ray tube with uh, line emission of X-ray uh, pulse durations, typically in the femtosecond domain, but they are not new to, not tunable. Um, nevertheless, I will show you an example uh, of, of how you can get nice diffraction data, time with all diffraction data using laser plasma sources. In fact, the structural methods that were most commonly adopted uh, were ultra-fast X-ray diffraction. So X-ray diffraction, I don't need to tell you what it is about, uh, where you get the diffraction uh, pattern here after you know impinging an X-ray beam onto the crystal. Uh, but now you can uh, use pulsed X-rays and activate the crystal with a with a laser uh, pulse, uh, heating or coherent excitation, electronic excitation, what have you. And then you can probe, monitor the diffraction pattern as a function of time delay between the laser pulse and the X-ray pulse. And so you might get a blurring or uh, you might get the oscillation of these uh, the reflections or a blurring of the pattern due to melting, whatever disorder. Uh, and then you can follow even further down the recrystallization. A beautiful example was this one from the group of von der Linde who used a laser-based uh, uh, plasma source uh, where they observed the coherent phonons of uh, a bismuth crystal uh, on the 222 reflection. Uh, this is really uh, was one of the very first uh, examples and quite spectacular, I must say. 
uh, as an achievement. Uh, then you can also do laser, uh, sorry, you can you do solution X-ray scattering. Um, again, in the same pump probe configuration that I, as I just mentioned, uh, you excite a liquid jet, flowing liquid jet with a laser pulse, and you probe it with an X-ray pulse. And in which case you will get these ring patterns uh, which contain uh, information about the solute, but also about the solvent. And uh, out of this analysis, you can get information specifically about this, more specifically about the solute. This is an example here in the case of a cobalt complex where you see intramolecular oscill uh, oscillations, vibrations. And this was done, was published a few years ago. This is work done at the uh, L uh, free electron laser in Stanford. Now, when um, when we started uh, getting interested in structural dynamics and solutions, uh, X-ray solution scattering was not yet implemented. And uh, we decided to go for uh, X-ray absorption uh, or X-ray spectroscopy or core level spectroscopies to be more general. Uh, and in particular, you have different types of core level spectroscopy. So you can do transmission, so you can come with a tunable X-ray beam and probe through the sample and you get the next absorption spectrum. Typically you scan below the ionization can continuum for this, for a given shell. And then you cross into the continuum <clears throat> and uh, you generate a photo, photo electron above the continuum. I'll come back to this uh, uh, case, uh, but typically you get electronic structure and local geometry and I will explain in a minute how you get this information. Um, then once you have created a hole uh, in an inner shell, it's gonna be refilled by X-ray emission. For typically for the K shell, it would be K beta, K alpha, or K valence to core. And, and these emissions contain information about the electronic structure of the system, but also about its spin state. And the third technique, so these techniques are called photon in, photon out. Uh, but you can have also photon in, electron out. So you measure the kinetic energy of the um, ele photo electron that you have generated by uh, sending a beam above the ionization threshold for this shell. And so you can determine the absolute binding energy of the different shells. And that's quite interesting because these binding energies uh, differ somewhat from um, uh, from uh, uh, for identical atoms depending on their chemical environment. So you get information also about the chemical bond. So this is really the, the basis of the famous technique called uh, uh, electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis, which was developed, uh, which, uh, which uh, was recognized by the Nobel Prize to Ziegban in 1982, if I'm not mistaken. So anyway, all these techniques gave rise to a rich uh, zoo of acronyms uh, which, I mean, okay, anyway. Uh, and, and in particular, these three, ESCA, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy or X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy refer to the uh, photon in electron out techniques. Now let's go back to X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, an X-ray absorption spectrum looks like, like this. You have sotus-like features riding on a high background as you scan the energy. And these, uh, these uh, edges, so-called edges are due to the extraction of electrons from given shells. And uh, um, when they reach the ionization threshold, you have this edge jump. So this is the ionization threshold for the K shell, L1 shell. So they are named after, the edges are named after the shells they stem from. Um, and by the way, you know that where where this nomenclature KLM uh, comes from, uh, the first person to discover shells, uh, uh, absorption shells, uh, sorry, absorption edges in X-ray spectroscopy was Sir Charles Barkla around 1905. He used a very, very ingenious way uh, that was prior to the discovery of diffraction. So there were no dispersive elements and, and he used different filters and found that um, elements or metals, for example, had shells, uh, had the edges, absorption edges. And uh, he discovered first the first two edges um, and he named them after the first two letters of his name, BA. But then he thought, well, if I start at B and then I go to A, then there is nothing afterwards. 
So he, he had a kind of a feeling that maybe other shells would be discovered. So he decided to switch to KL. And that's how he named uh, yeah, the shells KLM. And that's where this nomenclature comes from. Anyway, if you um, zoom into one of these uh, edges, what you see, uh, you see pre uh, below the edge, some uh, features, uh, modulations on the edge and above the edge. And the origin, the, these uh, modulations are called Xanes and XFs modulations. And I'll explain how they come about. Take an isolated atom. I'm sorry, maybe you are all familiar with X-ray absorption spectroscopy, but I think it's worth making the point why, you know, it's an interesting structural tool. So let's come back to this. You have an isolated atom, and if you tune the incident uh, X-ray energy across uh, the ionization threshold, uh, you might hit resonance as if these uh, uh, shells are not completely occupied, and you might get bound-bound transition just be below the edge. And once you cross into the ionization continuum, you create a photoelectron whose de Broglie wavelength is inversely proportional to the root square of the difference between the incident uh, photon energy and the ionization energy. Um, and, and that gives rise to an edge jump. And if you have an isolated atom, it will be featureless. Now, if you, this atom has a neighbor, like in a diatomic molecule, for example, then this photoelectron with quantum mechanic, will quantum mechanically scatter off this neighbor and will give rise to, uh, th there will be an interference pattern between the outgoing and the backscattered photoelectron uh, 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 pattern. Uh, um, photoelectron waves, which gives rise to modulations of the absorption coefficient. Um, and these modulations are what we call Xanes, X-ray near edge absorption structure, and uh, XAFs, extended X-ray absorption fine structure. Um, now you can easily imagine that if for some reason the distance between these two atoms changes, then so will the interference pattern between the photoelectron waves, and therefore this absorption uh, coefficient modulation will also change. Now, if you subtract the atomic background, uh, you end up with a spectrum in energy space, you, which you can convert into wave vector space, and wave vectors are the Fourier transform of, of uh, distances. And therefore, you can get, uh, by an analysis of the Xanes and the Xafs, I am making it uh, very, very uh, crude, uh, where you can get the radial distribution function around the absorbing atom. So why do we like X-ray spectroscopy? First, you can implement it in any type of medium. And in particular, we were very uh, uh, much interested in the liquid phase. It's element specific. So you're looking at specific atoms. You can detect optically silent species uh, or configurations, uh, geometric configurations, I mean. Um, you get information about the electronic structure, uh, density of occupied or unoccupied states, information about the valence orbitals, because when you are tuning just below the edge, you are just below the ionization threshold, you are interrogating valence orbitals. And it's the valence orbitals that make the chemical bond, right? Um, degree of oxidation. If you reduce or oxidize an atom, you will get a shift of the edge to lower or higher energies because you need less or more work, respectively, to extract a core electron. You get information about local symmetry. I didn't say anything about that, but never mind. Trust me. And about the spin state, especially from the uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy. And then you get also the local geometry again uh, uh, around uh, a, a specific element. Now, of course, this gives you only the local structure around the absorbing atom, contrary to uh, X-ray diffraction, where you get the global structure. However, since we were interested in ultra-fast phenomena, short time scales scale with short distance scales. So that's fine for us. OK, the way we do the experiments, and that could be for spectroscopy or scattering, is you have a flowing liquid jet, uh, and you excite it with a laser a pulse, and you come with a tunable X-ray pulse, uh, 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 whose time delay with respect to the laser can be also tuned, uh, varied, and you record the transmission at a given time delay through the sample. Uh, 
This gives you uh, absorption spectra, and usually our signals are always plotted as the excited transmission minus the unexcited uh, sample transmission. Now, uh, what you can do also is work with a fixed uh, energy monochromatic beam, uh, sorry, incident X-ray beam uh, pulse, and you can record the diffraction or the scattering pattern and do solution scattering. And uh, for free, if you have an analyzer, you can also analyze the emitted radiation and you get the X-ray emission spectrum in the same experiment as you do the X-ray scattering. So in all cases, be it scattering, X-ray emission or absorption, you always look at the signal of the excited sample minus that of the unexcited sample. Now, when we started the, uh, this work uh, in the mid 1990s, um, of course, we were interested in femtosecond spectroscopy. I had a, a lab uh, of laser spectroscopy. And um, actually, I'm originally, I come from the synchrotron community. Then I switched to ultrafast laser spectroscopy. And at some point in the mid 1990s, I decided to merge the two together. Uh, and at that time, synchrotrons were the only pulse sources of. Uh, of, uh, of uh, X-ray uh, radiation, uh, X-ray pulses. And uh, as I said, the pulse width was in the tens of picosecond regime. Um, <clears throat> however, we started saying, okay, look, there is nothing really in this field. So let's work with uh, synchrotron radiation and this uh, time resolution. And we'll see if laser, uh, if we manage to get femtosecond pulses later. And indeed these uh, femtosecond pulses could be uh, extracted towards uh, the second half of the 2000s from synchrotrons uh, using the slicing scheme. This is a scheme that was developed by Bob Schoenlein at the ALS in the early 2000s. It consists in co-propagating with the electron bunch an intense femtosecond pulse, which uh, by interaction between the electromagnetic radiation and the electrons slices out two wedges from the main bunch and uh, um, with adequate optics, you can separate the radiation that is emitted by one of these femtosecond duration electron uh, uh, bunches. Uh, the drawback is that you get a dramatic drop in flux because if you have if you start off with typically a hundred picosecond uh, electron bunch and you slice out a hundred femtosecond out of it, you easily and probably more than lose three orders of magnitude uh, very easily. So these these fluxes are very weak in these uh, femtosecond X-ray pulses. Nevertheless, we managed to use them with success in doing the first uh, femtosecond X-ray absorption experiment of a solution system. Anyway, the big development, in my opinion, uh, in implementing time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy was uh, to develop the detection. And this was done when we were um, working on it in the 1990s. The first step prior to even coupling a laser to the beam line was to manage to record uh, a single <clears throat> uh, electron bunch, select a single electron bunch and record it at the rep rate we wanted. Now, this is a bunch filling pattern typical of the SLS, ALS, Electra, but of course you have other bunch filling patterns. Nevertheless, whatever the bunch filling pattern, so this is a DSLS where you have the, this big gap with an intense uh, bunch, electron bunch, which uh, gives a typical 50 to 100 picosecond pulse. And then it's followed by weaker bunches, uh, which give rise to two, nas two nanosecond spaced pulses. So we wanted to use this bunch in, in this gap of about 120 uh, nanoseconds to do our time resolved studies. And so the first thing was to find a way of, 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 of gating the detection, which, which sounds like not big deal nowadays, but at that time it wasn't done. So we, we used the techniques from the laser lab and gated the detection to be able to detect only one out of, let's say, you know, X uh, pulses coming out of the synchrotron. This doesn't mean that these bunches don't go through the sample, they do. But nevertheless, what you want is to record the specific bunch because that's the one you are going to synchronize to your laser. We did this at the uh, 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 ESRF in Grenoble. I remember in one night in 1997, we managed to record 
uh, an extra absorption spectrum of iodine uh, in, in solution. Uh, there was a 32 bunch filling and we compared the 32 bunch filling with a 16 bunch filling. And so we, we, we could record one out of two uh, bunches. Next step was to couple the laser to the beam line. And we did this at the ALS where they had already a laser installed at one of their beam lines, which they were using for doing melting experiments with an X-ray probe. And um, at that time, short pulse lasers were only operating at typically one to two kilohertz. So we, we, we used what we had. And then uh, the idea was to synchronize this laser to the synchrotron uh, to, via the radio frequency cavity of the synchrotron. This was done. And then you could record um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the X-ray pulses at two kilohertz while the laser is running at one kilohertz, which means that you get the sample uh, X-ray signal uh, excited, unexcited, excited, unexcited, and so on. Um, and the uh, time delay between the X-ray and the uh, uh, X-ray uh, and the um, uh, and the um, laser pulse uh, was tuned using uh, electronics and and uh, uh, different uh, uh, electronics gating uh, schemes. Uh, now you can see that if you use a one kilohertz laser with a one megahertz machine, uh, you are wasting one thousand pulses that are unused, 1,000 of these pulses. So uh, later in the 2000s, uh, the, uh, um, some high repetition rate lasers started to be commercialized. And my group and I were immediately replaced the one kilohertz laser by a high repetition rate laser uh, that was running basically at half the rep rate of the synchrotron at the SLS. Uh, so this was then immediately adopted by all synchrotrons that had uh, 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 laser coupled to a beam line for time result studies. And so you see that now you basically on a shot to shot basis record laser on, laser uh, off, laser on, laser off, and you take the difference. So we had to also develop a, a higher um, a rep rate detection scheme to record so much uh, so much uh, information. Now, when you go from one kilohertz to 520 kilohertz, you gain a, a data acquisition time of root square of 520, which is about 25, a uh, factor of 25, which was indeed this this uh, this much. And um, and of course, then you can uh, you can get much higher signal to noise ratios, which was quite nice. Okay, uh, later on then uh, came the free electron lasers. <clears throat> and the first one was built in Germany, which was a flash machine um, at the end of the 2000s. Uh, it was a extreme UV machine, but the first hard X-ray machine was built at uh, uh, L, uh, Stanford, this is the LCLS. And um, uh, a free electron laser consists in, uh, in uh, shooting into a, a series of undulators, uh, high energy electrons. So high energy, the, the energy of the incoming electrons determines the energy of the output uh, X-ray photons. And therefore, the, the, the higher this energy, the, 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 the shorter the wavelengths of these X-rays. And that's why you need a linear accelerator. So this was the linear accelerator in Stanford that was exploited to do this. And then uh, once you the electrons go through the undulator, they start emitting uh, you know, synchrotron radiation. Uh, but then <clears throat> there is a buildup of uh, the interaction due to the interaction between the electromagnetic radiation and the uh, uh, um, electrons, you get a phenomenon called microbunching, which aligns the uh, charges into uh, 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 very specific steps and uh, leads to a ramping up of the output power of the X-rays at the end of the machine. So this is not per se a laser, but it's very much laser-like. And that's why we call it self-amplified -ampl spontaneous emission. Uh, the second hard X-ray machine was built in in Japan. Uh, it's a Sakla machine where they have Spring 8. And then uh, now there is uh, um, there are hard X-ray machines, additional ones in uh, Germany, in Hamburg, uh, in Switzerland, and in um, South Korea. Okay, compared to synchrotrons, you gain six orders of magnitude more flux 
with an X-ray, free electron laser, and three orders of magnitude shorter pulses compared to the synchrotron. Uh, and if you compare it to the slicing that was implemented in the, the at synchrotrons, you get a 10 orders of magnitude gain in photon flux. So this is a game changer. I'm talking about hard X-ray photons here. Okay, so I'll give you some examples of what we did um, over the years. Uh, and uh, the first series of uh, measurements we did were on transition metal complexes. Why transition metal complexes? Well, um, apart from the numerous applications they, they, uh, or potential applications, they're involved with solar energy photocatalysis, optical materials, OLEDs, optical writing, magnetic reading, and so on. Um, they are uh, nice because they have absorptions in the hard X-ray regime. And the first experiments we implemented were done in air or in a helium atmosphere. Uh, so the, it was co more comfortable to work there, but there is rich, rich chemistry and physics uh, underlying these systems. And I will show you some examples. So our first demonstration of uh, picosecond X-ray absorption spectroscopy, by the way, I should say that prior to us, there was work by uh, Lin Chen uh, done with nanosecond resolution, but the data acquisition scheme was different because it was cumulative. It was really um, uh, recording uh, under laser irradiation for several seconds, the X-ray absorption spectrum, and then recording without the, uh, for, again, for several seconds, without the uh, laser on. Uh, now, this is perfectly, uh, uh, feasible. However, we, we did a systematic study and the shot-to-shot -shot data acquisition scheme that we uh, uh, developed was more reliable because it avoids uh, short-term but also long-term drifts of the sample and of the machine. As you know, synchrotrons tend to, uh, you know, have their intensity go down with with time. So um, this was recorded on the, on the basis of a shot-to-shot -shot uh, experiment. So what happens to this ruthenium tris-biperidine complex? When you excite it, you transfer an electron. If you excite it in the UV or the visible, you transfer an electron from the ruthenium atom to the ligand. And therefore, you end up with a, you start off with a ruthenium 2 plus and you end up with a ruthenium 3 plus uh, and a reduced ligand. And when we did the pump off, pump on minus pump off, we got this beautiful transient at 60 picosecond time delay. Now, since you have the different spectrum of excited minus unexcited and the ground state spectrum shown in red here, then you, you can generate knowing the photolysis yield, the excited state spectrum, which is shown in blue, which you can compare to, um, you know, data for ruthenium three plus compounds, steady state spectrum, you see with the green and the blue agree quite well. Now, the, but this is a different molecule. Now, um, how do we understand this? So the first thing you see is that there is a blue shift of the edge. No wonder we oxidized the ruthenium atom, and therefore you need more work in order to extract another core electron, in this case from the 2p3 half. And this resonance that pops up here is due to the fact that in the octahedral symmetry of the compound, the uh, ruthenium 2 plus, which has a 4d6 uh, um, uh, orbital, um, all these d6 electrons, they, they, the, orb the d orbitals split into bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, T2G and EG in this octahedral symmetry. And all the six orbitals are in the lower T2G orbital. Now, if I uh, transfer the electron to the ligand, it disappears. And now I have a hole in this uh, uh, T2G orbital, which I can fill by transition from the 2P3 half. So this is the origin of this resonance. And then we also showed uh, that we could extract from the XFs, which is at higher energies. Also, we did the structural analysis and get the structure of this new compound. OK, this work, which was the first, I dare say, picosecond time result extra absorption experiment, uh, was followed by a rich uh, harvest of other studies, which we did then, but also many people started picking up this uh, this uh, uh, method and 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 did uh, quite a lot of x-ray absorption spectroscopy so we looked at the two electron um, transfer from uh, uh, two centers so this is 
in this class of compounds, you have rhenium and halogens, and it was suspected from uh, time-resolved infrared studies that you transfer an electron density both from the metal and the halogen, and we could unambiguously prove that this was the case by X-ray absorption spectroscopy, time-resolved, and we looked at these a family of compounds uh, called the D8, D8 compounds like diplatinum, diiridium, dirhodium, which uh, uh, in the ground state on have, there is no bond between the two metal atoms. Uh, but if you excite them, you go from D to P and therefore you form a bond. So this is one of the few cases where the excited state has shorter distances than uh, equilibrium distances in the excited state. And we could demonstrate this by X-ray absorption spectroscopy uh, in the case of a diplatinum compound. Then we looked at the very exciting case of how does a solvation shell, water solvation shell, changes when you go from a hydrophilic to a hydrophobic um, <clears throat> uh, uh, solute. In this case, we took a simple solute, iodide. We removed the electron with a laser pulse and looked at the changes of the solvation shell. This was quite an exciting work. And then we, we're still uh, pursuing this type of studies. And then also what happens to molecules when they lose a ligand uh, due to some photo excitation and then pick up a, a solvent molecule and form a new molecule. Now, <clears throat> The most, one of the most pop, um, successful cases of coordination chemistry compound that we studied was the iron-2 complexes. These are iron-2 polypyridine complexes that have become very popular back in the 1980s and are still being very much studied because they can undergo spin changes from S equals zero to S equals two under the effect of pressure, temperature, or uh, light excitation. And... <clears throat> because they are very flexible in terms of chemistry, you can engineer the ligands in such a way that you uh, can prolong the lifetime of the high spin state even to you know days and weeks. So they are very interesting uh, for uh, data storage and reading. Uh, they occur in biology. And the reason why I'm showing this case here is because I'm, it introduces the bio, biological part I will mention later. And then you also have uh, solar energy application where you want to minimize actually uh, <clears throat> the population of high spin states and maximize the charge transfer so that you excite a molecule with solar light, it injects an electron into, for example, a titanium dioxide semiconductor, and then you can generate current. Now, along this iron and bond distance, because you go from bonding orbitals to anti-bonding ones, so this is really the reaction coordinate of the spin change, um, you have these potential curves, uh, potential energy curves. So this is a ground state with its equilibrium distance, and you have the metal to ligand charge transfer state. And when you excite them, you end up in the high spin state, which has an equilibrium distance that is uh, much larger than that of the ground state. Now, <clears throat> when we undertook the study of this compound, uh, the structure change was not known. This is called spin crossover, by the way. Nor was it known how fast this occurs, this process after excitation, uh, let alone which mechanism uh, does it uh, uh, operate, i.e. which states can be visited on the way down to the high spin state. So we took uh, when Duck took the study, and by the way, uh, these questions were due to the fact that uh, uh, there were no optical, especially these two last questions, there were no optical domain observables of the high spin state known at that time. So we did picosecond experiments <clears throat> first. Uh, so you have the ground state in black, and then you have the transient pumped minus unpumped, and then out of this you can generate the high spin X-ray absorption spectrum, and we identified an X-ray observable of the high spin state, uh, and we could determine that bond distance elongation, which was 10% of the ground state bond distance, which is quite huge for a molecule. Then uh, came the slicing, and so we had uh, we could extract femtosecond uh, pulses out of the synchrotron, and <clears throat> We immediately exploited them. So by sitting into this resonance here, which is an observable of the high spin state and scanning with time, we could find out that uh, you could reach, you, you reach the, the high spin state in less than 100 femtoseconds, which is very fast. 
surprisingly fast because it's a delta s equals to uh, change. Uh, and then we could also uh, um, um, uh, scan the point by point the X-ray absorption spectrum at 300 femtosecond to make sure that we are really in the high spin state. And this is what you see in this uh, in this uh, plot here as uh, blue blue points, blue data points. Later on, um, the group of Kelly Gaffney at the LCLS free electron laser implemented X-ray emission. And as I told you, X-ray emission is sensitive to the spin state. So using model compounds where you see the changes of the K-beta emission, depending on the spin state of the compound, the ground state, spin state, the ground spin state, uh, you can, they could conclude that the, during the cascade, one of the triplet state was populated as an intermediate step towards a high spin state. Okay, um, this brings me to the subject of protein dynamics because in fact, <clears throat> um, this is, Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin uh, is composed of four uh, monomers, which are like myoglobin. And uh, the active center of, of myoglobin or hemoglobin is this porphyrin where uh, oxygen fixes itself when you are breathing. Now it's known in, and there is a phenomenon in, in biology called allostery where uh, in the case of uh, hemoglobin, if you fix an oxygen in one of the monomers, the affinity of the other three in to, pick, to pick up oxygen increases. So this is uh, this uh, losteric cooperativity. And uh, it's quite a fascinating phenomenon. And the origin of it was uh, explained by uh, Max Perutz, who determined the structure of uh, myoglobin. Uh, his idea was that, uh, okay, when you go from the from the ligated with the oxygen bound to the iron atom, the shape of the porphyrin is flat. If you uh, release the oxygen, it goes domed. Now in the flat, in the planar form, it's low spin. In the domed form, it's high spin. Uh, and so this uh, change from uh, planar to domed occurs not only with oxygen, actually, you could have CO binding or NO binding on the iron atom, and you will get the same change from low spin to high spin. Now, when it goes domed, there is this histidine, which is related to the F helix and the E helices. Um, so it pushes the F helix, which affects also the E helix. And there seems to be a cooperativity uh, through this mechanical motion of the helices, which leads to the uh, uh, tends to relax state of uh, hemoglobin, uh, which was discussed in this paper by uh, Max Perutz in, in very much detail. Okay, so we wanted to understand this transition, which we dare call you know, the transition state of the respiratory function, because this is what determines all that uh, occurs at later times. So I want to make a point about heme proteins because the very first femtosecond experiments ever to be carried out on the molecular system were done on heme proteins. And actually the first ever X-ray, time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy experiment to be done regardless of the detection method, spectroscopy or scattering was done on myoglobin by Mills and coworkers uh, with microsecond resolution. Uh, so this is, heme proteins have a special uh, role, uh, played a special role in time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy. So the key question is how fast does it take, uh, play, uh, does it take to go from ligated to uh, planar to domed unligated? So from low spin to high spin. And uh, there was a debate, is this an electronic cascade as I just showed you for iron trist by pyridine, or is it that you generate a hot, high spin state immediately. So we carried out experiments. I'm not going to show you data. I'm sorry. Uh, so <clears throat> what we did is basically uh, we, we, we did X-ray emission and X-ray absorption spectroscopy on these systems on myoglobin, but also on cytochrome C, myoglobin NO and cytochrome C. And what we found is that the, the relaxation cascade leading to the high spin uh, uh, domed state is a cascade through spin state through spin states. So it's very much like what we have for 
I wrench with my pyridine. And the time scales can change a bit from one system to the other. And then we compare them to other studies. Uh, these are optical studies, but uh, you see that the time scales can change a bit from one system to the other. But overall, the big picture is that we have the same dynamics as in iron polypyridine complexes, which we have and others characterize in much detail. So breathing is a question of spin, not so much a question of uh, thermal effect. However, some of these proteins like cytochrome C, ferric cytochrome C, uh, does not, um, is not involved in the respiratory function. So why, why, what is the role of doming in these, non, in these heme proteins? And by the way, I want to stress that the doming is independent of whether you, you dissociate the ligand or not, or whether you have a high spin or a low spin state, uh, sorry, um, a ferric or a ferrous state. So it's, it's occurring in all cases. So this is still an open question. What is the role of doming in non-respiratory heme proteins? Now, briefly, I will mention what we did on, on, uh, on uh, mater in material science. Um, uh, so uh, we, we were mostly interested in, in uh, uh, materials for solar energy. So like uh, uh, metal oxides, like titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And uh, we could determine what are the trapping sites of the electron in, uh, in the case of uh, titanium dioxide that is either photo excited or sensitized by a dye molecule that you photo excite and inject the electron into the substrate. This is uh, the, the, the ge geometry or the architecture of the famous disensitized solar cells. For zinc oxide, we could also determine uh, the hole trapping, which is not trivial. Uh, now, uh, because holes in, in these metal oxides um, are uh, uh, located, I mean, the, the, the valence band is dominated by the orbitals, the oxygen orbitals. That is, you, that means that you need extra soft X-ray spectroscopy. Now it's feasible. It's been done recently at the, the uh, South Korean free electron laser on titanium dioxide. But at that time, it wasn't possible to determine uh, the hole trapping in, in these uh, metal oxide. And more recently, we did the detailed characterization combining X-ray absorption and uh, X-ray uh, diffraction of uh, lead halide perovskites. I'm not going to go more into details. I just want to say that uh, there are some new perspectives in X-ray spectroscopy. One of them is uh, X-ray studies of molecular chirality. Now, chirality is this property of <clears throat> some molecules to have uh, their mirror image that is not superimposable. This is like our left and right hands. You cannot superimpose them, but there are Im mirror images of the, the two. Now. In nature, you have many uh, of these molecules. However, biological function, and especially in the in humans, um, uh, biolog uh, uh, biological functions are homochiral. So they can only react to one while the other so-called enantiomer uh, can have a, a negative or even a toxic effect on the organism. So you can imagine why this is so important for the pharmaceutical industry, how can you, I mean, the, the goal is to be able to isolate um, one form of enantiomer as compared to the other. So you have to develop asymmetric synthesis, uh, which is really a, a huge challenge in chemistry, but you also have to detect them. And we are more interested in the detection of enantiomers. Now, the technique to detect enantiomers is as old as uh, uh, the 19th century and was di discovered by Louis Pasteur. Uh, and it's called optical circular dichroism spectroscopy. That is the um, differential absorption between uh, right and left-handed circularly polarized light that uh, is absorbed by a chiral sample. And this difference uh, gives you information about the handedness of the molecules. Of course, if you have a 50-50% uh, mixture, you won't get anything. Now, the problem with optical circular dichroism spectroscopy is optical by, by this, I mean, uh, visible UV infrared, is that it corresponds to 0.1% of the absorption. So these are very, very, very weak signals. Now, why going into the X-ray? 
Uh, one of the reasons is the signal scale as A over lambda, where A is a molecular size, lambda is the wavelength of light. So <clears throat> by decreasing the wavelength of light by two orders of magnitude, you can enhance a signal. I wouldn't say by two orders of magnitude, but at least one of the order of magnitude, which is already a, grain, a great gain. And then you access the element selectivity. Now, the interesting thing, uh, uh, according to theory, is that <clears throat> the uh, dichroic response of these different elements uh, uh, varies with the distance from the chiral center. So now you have a means of distinguishing identical, chemically identical atoms uh, by their differential dichroic response and their chemical shift. So here you have noradrenaline absorption, where you have blobs due to different carbons absorbing in the, you know, in the soft X-ray. And now if you can uh, combine the chemical shift with the differential dichroic response, you can distinguish who is who in, in these spectra. So you get a very, very powerful uh, structural analysis tool. In addition, there is uh, um, a different dichroic response if you are in the pre-edge and the post-edge region. So you get additional information about X-ray um, about the local structure. So this technique, soft X-ray natural circular dichroism, as it's called, uh, will allow you to distinguish identical but non-equivalent atoms in a molecule uh, by combining both dichroic response and the chemical shift. And nowadays, this is uh, feasible because we can have now flat liquid jets in vacuum, so you can work in the soft X-ray regime without any problem. And this is actually the core uh, topic of my new proposal. And then there is a development of uh, nonlinear spectroscopy, which is identical to what happened uh, after the advent of uh, <clears throat> the laser in the 60s, where you had a, a development of different, all sorts of different nonlinear techniques. And I want to stress especially the second harmonic generation of frequency mixing techniques because they are sensitive to interfaces and this way you can be element selective uh, during, for example, photocatalysis or catalysis and detect selectively which atom is doing what during the catalytic process. You don't need femtosecond resolution for that, of course. And we recently reviewed these techniques. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, you for your attention and patience and thank again the ACA for awarding me uh, and this, uh, this great honor, uh, the, the Ronley Award. Uh, and also, um, I again apologize for not being uh, present. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much um, for a beautiful talk. We definitely could hear it very well and follow all of your explanations. The floor is open for questions. So I had a, here we go. Uh, this, so this is more of a career discussion, but um, what is the favorite part of the job? I didn't get the question. What is the? Favorite part of your job. The, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I don't get it. What is the favorite part of your job? We have some career panels here oh. too, so students are encouraged to, you know, explore more than just science. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. That's a, that's a good question. The favorite part is uh, exploring the unknown. I mean, you, you develop a tool and you use it to address scientific questions, which is what we were doing. We wanted a tool to look at the uh, molecules and liquids uh, with, uh, you know, with, with element specificity and get the structure. Uh, and, and it, you know, you start with one system and then you, you jump into another question and then gradually you kind of have, uh, uh, you, you're exploring the unknown. I mean, it's really fascinating. Uh, to be honest, we didn't set to study initially necessarily the coordination chemistry compounds back in the 1990s, 
but we because we started with other systems but then we decided to look at these because somehow they offered us a higher chance of demonstrating the methodology and from that then we got really interested into coordination chemistry compounds and thereafter into uh, biology uh, metallic proteins uh, yeah that, that's the way it goes it's a kind of feedback loop between what you do and what you see and then you ask questions and you move ahead Majid, it's John Halliwell here congratulations on your award, much deserved. Um, the question about Ahmed Zawail, um, at his website he also had an ambition to study uh, time uh, dependence of, of uh, uh, molecule binding to myoglobin at, at the iron sign. Um, but I, I never saw a publication. Are, are you able to offer any insight on experiments that he made that were not concluded? <coughs> yeah, in fact, yeah, hi John, uh, thanks for your kind words. Uh, uh, yes, actually, so, so Ahmed was developing ultrafast electron diffraction, as you know, um, and uh, he, he did absolutely spectacular uh, breakthroughs through uh, the 2000s and early 2010. There are some experiments, actually there is one experiment and I'm a co-author with him because we complemented the measurements uh, in Switzerland, not by diffraction but optical measurements. Uh, some of these are on, uh, on materials mostly, yes. Uh, I know that he did towards the end also some biological uh, systems, uh, but unfortunately, you know, he didn't have time to pursue this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Greetings from You're Baltimore. Welcome. Yeah, okay, thanks. Likewise. Hi, Majed, congratulations. This is Tom Fetzel here. Um, just following up on uh, what John said, I wonder if, just as a matter of speculation, do you think that, well, you've extended the time domain so much, and whenever you extend, extend any domain, you always learn many, many new things. Do you think that the Possibilities now will will lead to uh, an extension or, or um, improvement in our understanding of this uh, mechanism for allosteria and hemoglobin that Max elucidated so so beautifully many years ago. Uh, okay, so so this uh, this is uh, a great question. Uh, I think I mean I, I'm personally quite fascinated by this phenomenon. Um, I think it, it, it requires, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try it with what I showed you today. And I, I was showing really the very, very first events that take place in the sub-picosecond time domain. But if you really want to look at a lost story per se, um, my feeling is that one would need to use, uh, well, probably time result X-ray crystallography, but also combine it, although I don't know if anyone is pursuing this area, with uh, optical domain multidimensional spectroscopy. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but these are basically the optical domain analogs of NMR. And being optical domain, you can go into much shorter time scale. Uh, of course, for a lot of we don't need super short time scales, uh, so multidimensional spectroscopy should still be feasible. I, I don't know why, uh, to my knowledge, no one is pursuing this, but maybe someone is doing it, I would be happy to, <laughs> to find out. I don't know if I answered your question. Thank you. He says thank you. I had a question. Um, how worried are you about whether or not some of these materials that you are investigating actually are damaged by the repeated laser and x-ray beams or whether they always do the same thing when they are excited. Because clearly you're doing the slicing where you do the excited and unexcited and with the spectroscopy you obviously have to scan the wave maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Very good question. Actually, uh, prior to any of these measurements, we characterize a sample. Actually, more often than not, the, the big damage doesn't come from the X-ray, it comes from the laser, the pump laser, the, the excitation laser. Uh, this is a lot of energy, a lot of, uh, you know, high fluences, high fluxes, and they tend to sometimes damage the sample. Of course, we also have to characterize the behavior under X-radiation, especially at free electron lasers, but any of these studies that I have shown, uh, we carefully check for all these effects prior to doing anything. And uh, we also check for multiphoton excitation because we need to excite a high yield of, uh, or to have a high yield, excitation yield in the sample in order to detect something. I mean, typically all these measurements, I would say that we are in the, the few percent excitation yield. Uh, it, you can increase the yield by increasing the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the laser, but then you, you start going into multiphoton regimes. So the other criterion that one has to be very careful about is multiphoton excitation. So you have to make sure that you're in the linear regime. No, so, I mean, to answer your question, in all these cases, and I guess all, pe all the people, all the colleagues working in this area, are very careful about that because, of course, I mean, if you damage your sample, then that's too bad. <laughs> it's no, no longer reproducible. Any other final questions? If not, let's let's thank Majid again. Once again, congratulations and thank you for a very thank nice you. talk. We enjoyed watching it.